We have a, an organization that we're working with in Sweden, actually, that's focused on CBD, called CBD Solutions. And it's a group, uh, I think, somewhat similar to the Tau Consortium in that it was formed by uh, one, one woman who, who had the disease and, and then subsequently funded it. But they are asking if anybody here who has CBD or, or related caregiver would fill out one of these questionnaires and, and they kind of look, they look like this, they're green and they'll be, they'll be out at the, uh, the desk there. If you, if, you could, if you could fill one of those out and, and leave them at the desk, that would be very helpful to, to them and, and to the cause as well. So uh, we will now introduce uh, Joellen Fox, who's a physical therapy physical therapist at the Dan Aaron Parkinson's Rehabilitation Center in Philadelphia and one of the leading experts in this area. And uh, she has more, of a decade, more than a decade of professional experience within the University of Pennsylvania Health System. And uh, I urge you to welcome her and I'm sure she'll have some terrifically helpful information for all of us. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to get my slides up here, and we will get started. It has been wonderful coming from Philadelphia to the wonderful city of Gainesville. I've been squinting. Michelle and I were just talking, but the sun is out, which is so exciting for me. Um, and it's just a beautiful area. So thank you for having me. Um, what Michelle and I will be talking about are practical tips, and I loved what Dr. McFarland said when he made the comparison of horses to zebras to unicorns, because I will often say to people, as I once was told by one of my patients, that having Parkinson's or atypical Parkinson's is like being a snowflake. She identified herself that way because she felt, despite the support group she went to, the learning, the education, what she got, she never found that she was the same to anybody else. What has made my job so interesting is that although day to day I work one on one with people, not one person, be it two people with PSP, a, a myriad of people with Parkinson's disease, not does one person look the same as the other, nor do I do the same thing or make the same recommendations person to person. So although I'll be talking about tips today, I don't want you to generalize them to everybody although do take away some information from them, and I hope to educate you on the gist of why these tips are being made. So I have three patients that I'm going to be talking about who I have known for many years, some about three years, some about seven years. The first patient, we'll call him B, hopefully I don't say his name, I know him quite well, is a person with PSP, and the diagnosis was made about four years ago. So how, what were his red flags, as Dr. McFarland said? He had difficulty with his eyes, an inability to look up or down. You could see some changes in that. Also, the biggest thing was a very early onset of falls backwards, something we don't commonly see when a diagnosis, say, just of Parkinson's disease is made. And also, although he was taking carbidopa levodopa, it didn't really have much effect. He felt no different. So in terms of return and follow-up with therapy, I told B when we met, this is chapter one of a very long book. You're going to know me for a very long time, so I hope you like me. And, um, <laughs> and this relates to maintenance and monitoring progress. Something that we do very much at Penn is that from a therapy standpoint, I am working with you one-on-one -on -one for an hour. I get to know a lot about you. I often say to people when we first meet, this is not about me telling you what to do. This is about me learning what you do do and trying to become part of that and, and help you along with that and make changes to it. So I've known him for a while. His frequency has reduced to a point now where he follows up once every other week with us. But he also once a week attends our seated exercise group, um, which has been an establishment for 15 years now. One of our fellows just celebrated his 90th birthday in the group, which was quite fun. Um, but he does come to that, so we keep our eyes on him. His current level of function is that he has constant supervision. He has a wonderful aide by the name of Patrick, I can say his name, he said, um, who is with him side by side, and his spouse is also wonderful as well and has been trained with us. He uses a scooter for the community and a four-wheeled rolling walker, which we're gonna talk more about. I see a lot of them here, but then I also wanna talk about why we've recommended one slightly different for him. 
Like I said, he attends the weekly group, but he does have falls. So here, one point that I want to first start with is about his eyes, because that's a very important thing, and the role that PT has, especially is involved in exercise, which I'll talk about, but it's also fall prevention, because that can start people on a downward spiral. So we always want to nip that in the butt. So let me first talk about visual tracking. The earlier we can catch this and give you exercises to do, the better. So one of them, and believe it or not, that's a piece of artwork that's all post-it notes. I love it because I use post-its like you wouldn't believe I should get stock in them. But post-its, putting a series of post-its, say, with numbers or letters in big script and putting them on a blank wall, if you can find one in your home or an area, and sitting down and without moving your head, practicing moving your eyes to locate those different numbers. Playing a little cognitive game with it, okay, well, what year were we married? That can sometimes bring about a negative response, if you can't recall it, but um, how old are you? Different things like that. Spelling a word, for example. These are to be daily exercises, though, so we know it can be monotonous to do the same thing day to day. Changing it up, getting a little stack of tennis balls or a roll of tennis balls, placing them in a room on the floor, bright yellow tennis balls, and saying, I want you to sit here. Now find those tennis balls and moving with the eyes to find them. Likewise, the I spy game. I spy something red that's about the you know, size of my foot. What do you think I see? Look around, doing things like that. Now, this was when B had good control of his eyes. As progression occurs, we want that control to maintain. We know exercise is beneficial if you stick to it, not just do it a couple times this week, have a week off, and then maybe get back to it. I'm talking about repetition. But say you lose that ability to truly move the eyes and you cannot scan. Well, then it becomes a point of you're going to move your head, okay, and get your eyes to follow. So although the eyes may not be doing the movement, it's important to move the head because that's what you need to see that obstacle that's coming ahead. A lot of times in therapy, we will put obstacles all over the place and the idea is that you're looking, moving that head down. I'll even, and this can sometimes, it depends on a person's startle reflex, we use apps all the time. So I have foghorns that go off if people aren't using their eyes or aren't moving their head. You know, we make it fun. Now also for B, he has blepharospasm. And as Dr. McFarland talked about, his eyes will close. A big part initially that we worked on was the education piece because his wife was getting upset thinking that he was tuning her out. And that wasn't the case. It wasn't voluntary that his eyes were closing. He wasn't bored and he wasn't falling asleep. Rather, his eyes were shutting. He just wasn't communicating the fact that I'm not shutting them on purpose. So that was a big education piece on top of her ability to cue him, B, can you open your eyes? Are you trying to, yes or no? If he responds, no, I can't open them, then the training of using hands to help open the eyes, okay, and get those lids to lift and practicing that. How much is too much force? Sometimes just simply not telling a person what you're about to do and going at them is going to make them close their eyes more. So there is that training component to it. The falls backwards, so we're still on this fall theme. So a new mobility technique for B was that, oh, I almost said his name, was he has this rocket sign when getting up from a chair. And what that is, I know you can't really see me that well. Can you hear me? Yeah? OK. So when he would get up from a chair, he would go straight up and then fall back down, like a rocket, straight up in the air, OK? Dangerous. So what we educated him on is repetition and practice of leaning forward, coming to the edge of the chair. And he would do great with us, and then his aide and his spouse would say, he likes you, that's why he's doing great for you, he doesn't do this at home. So then, and we get that a lot. Well, and and it, it, it's funny in a way, but then it can also be really frustrating for the spouses and the family. Why do you do so well here and not at home? So then we try to organize it a little better. And I have them pick a, a hot color neon yellow, and I print out step by step what to do. And then it becomes my face on the sign that says, do what your therapist tells you, and you follow those steps. So it takes a little bit away from the caregiver of the nagging of scoot to the edge, lean forward, stand up, and rather follow these steps. Gives a little control back to the person, requires the attention to follow along, and the job gets done in a safe way. 
The assistive device that we use now, he's 6'2". So we know those four-wheeled rolling walkers weigh about 12 to 14 pounds. A 6'2 person who has a tendency to go backwards, guess what, 12 pounds is not keeping him forward. So we have tried using, and you've seen them in gyms, those sandbags. We tried a 10-pound sandbag. But that, too, can get clunky, and you can't always secure it perfectly. You know, it runs the chance of getting loose, and you, heaven forbid you wouldn't want that. There is something called a U-step. Has anybody heard of this rollator? A couple people. The U-step is a rollator that has a U-shaped bottom. It still has rotary wheels. It weighs 26 pounds, so it is a lot heavier. It has reverse brakes so that you have to squeeze it to get it to go, okay? Unlike squeezing it to get it to stop. Why is this important? Because if he's going and he starts to feel off balance, he's going to let go, but the rollator locks at that point, which is good. So we utilize that with him, and it's been very beneficial. This U-step also comes with a laser. You know, if people suffer from freezing of gait, it even comes with a metronome, which rhythmic auditory stimulus, which that can be another lecture. I can talk about that, but that's something that can be very helpful for people. So that's his assistive device right now. Compensatory techniques. This is a big one that I'm going to demo. His falls backwards. We fail to realize how much we do that involves bringing weight backwards a ton. Opening a drawer, opening the refrigerator, opening the car door. There are a ton of things that we do in which we bring things to ourselves, which can then lead to a person falling backwards because their balance strategies are delayed. So in that case with him, we've taught him a compensatory technique. At the refrigerator, I have a sign that says sideways. That's all the word is. And he knows when he goes to the fridge, rather than facing the door, that gives this anterior posterior movement. He stands to the side of the door and opens it like this. Now it's this side to side movement, which he has much better control over. Okay? Same thing with dishwashers. Pulling the dishwasher in, taking something out of the dishwasher, taking something out of the stove. Very dangerous thing. Hot plate of cookies coming out and leaning in or reaching in. Rather standing to the side, you have this side to side motion. Been very helpful. Likewise, and this has been an education piece because he is a little impulsive. If he drops something, he wants to immediately go down, grab it, and he pops right back up. That simple act of reaching low and coming up, boom, gravity is an amazing force. So we gave him a reacher. He got a little dangerous with that. He's a little frisky, his wife. <laughs> so we're like, ah, oh, I don't know about the reacher anymore. Um, but Patrick, his fella who is by his side, is aware that he tends to be impulsive when he drops things. Patrick's quicker. Patrick goes for it first. He says, hold on, and goes for it. So that was a compensation, or to compensate to do a different way. And then something we did try initially in terms of the falls backwards was a heel wedge. This is something definitely that you do need to see a therapist about rather than purchasing them, which you can do, um, because it depends on the thickness, et cetera. But if somebody is leaning backwards a lot, the addition of a heel wedge gives a little push forward, which can be helpful and can also hinder in some ways to start moving because then people fall forward. So it's a delicate balance and something with a trained eye of a therapist. Likewise, we talk to B all the time about what we call a power stance. Automatically, we often stand with feet side by side, which is okay in a person who naturally shifts their weight and gestures, but in somebody who has a lot of stillness to their being because of this disease, when you go to, say, look at somebody, it doesn't take a lot to cause a loss of balance. Therefore, power stance, a staggered stance, it's like having a kickback or um, a kickstand, excuse me. And that's very beneficial. All right, so that was B. Now we move on to E. He's my other fella. Very interesting course to his diagnosis. I have known him for, I think, three years. I became familiar with him when he was diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's disease at the age of 44. Very active fella. Came to me because you know, I've got this, this diagnosis. I've heard that exercise and Parkinson's disease can delay disease progression. I'm into exercise. Please prescribe me something. This is prehabilitation. He comes in, 
gives this high intensity interval training home exercise program. He is on board and then he's got a bum knee. So he goes in for his knee replacement and although the surgery went very well, he started having excessive issues with low blood pressure, often passing out and was diagnosed with orthostatic hypotension. This led to a significant decline in his walking and his balance, and then he came about a diagnosis of MSA. So it really um, caught him and his wife off guard. So his biggest things are the dizziness and the low blood pressure. He also very much, since this surgery, suffers from something we call antipulsion, the opposite direction of what I was talking about, of the backwards fall. E tends to, when he's walking, he's leaning forward and all of a sudden, Good. Antipulsion is something I'm going to talk on the next slide. He also suffers from freezing of gait, which is an akinesia, an actual motor block where he can't move his feet, and then he also falls. Right now I was seeing him at a frequency of two times a week, which was now reduced to once a week, once every other week. Now I follow up with him once a month, and basically it's my, did you do what you were supposed to do, which he does do. And then, okay, what's going on now? What do we need to do for the next month? His current level of function is that he has the supervision of his wife when he's outside, but inside he's independent. But he does use a trekking pole, and that's to help him with his posture and to help fight that leaning forward, which he experiences. Antipulsion. This is huge because it truly comes down to posture. I often say to people, I need you to feel your feet. Sometimes, this is about changing a person's understanding, making them think about their movement. Now, you see something that looks askew, but that person may not be feeling it or may not be aware of it. So to tell them to correct it, stand taller, you're gonna have to continue to tell them that until you ask them, where do you feel the weight in your feet? If the person responds, I feel the weight on my toes, I'm leaning forward, well, fix that bring your weight back a little bit more towards your heels. A common exercise we do for posture is having, and I call it a snow angel, that would not be familiar to many of you here. However, um, a snow angel looks something like that. Think of the upper body. I will tell people often to go to a wall, utilizing family and, and aids to assist, but press back, lean against that wall, bring your arms back, palms forward. It opens up the body and slide those arms up. That wall presents to the person what straight is. Oftentimes people will say, you're slumping. No, I'm not. You're no, I'm not. Well, it's because they feel that that posture is normal. And what we're trying to show is, no, this is your new normal. This is what you want to feel. Unfortunately, everything we do in a day-to-day -day activity is usually flex forward, eating, writing, talking. There's not much that we do that is extension. So it's a very good exercise to do. And the other is that rounded forward. He was starting to get, because he does have a lot of muscles, he was starting to really get a lot of pec tightness and leaning in. So it was a lot of retraction, which he really loved to do. He has TheraBands probably on every doorknob in his house because he loves going over and pulling on them and it makes them feel good, it makes them feel strong, but it's beneficial because it's a nice correction of the posture. Also for the antipulsion, we had to talk a lot about his feet, okay? Land with your heel. Lift your feet up as if you're lifting them up out of mud, giving that awareness. But a really key thing that helped him was something that we call destination estimation. So, saying RIE, you're gonna get from this room to the other and I want you to do it in 20 steps. Now, the great thing about it is it keeps his focus on his feet and not on the person in the other room, on what's on the television, on the person that might be walking towards them that at one point was a, a bit of anxiety, you know, when you're in a crowd, but rather focus on your feet, lift the feet, land with the heel. And that was very helpful. We've also used music with him, which he loves. Walking to the beat, moving to the music, getting a little groove on, which he enjoys. And then it makes the walking fun. Repetition is key. So I would always bang into his brain, if you just practice this with me and don't do it at home, we're not going to change the habit. So therefore, there were reminder signs at home. Lift your feet, land with your heel. And also, if you're in the middle of something that you know is gonna lead to something bad, 
Don't try to correct it as it's happening. Stop and restart. That was a very big thing. In terms of his freezing, what oftentimes initiated this, and Dr. McFarland even said something about it, was turning. He would go and turn and he would pivot. And because of that pivot, he wasn't shifting his weight side to side and he gave a stutter foot and feel like he couldn't move. It comes back to think about your feet. It's always feet first. So we say to people who feel like their feet get stuck, these four S's, stop. Don't try to fix it while you're in it. The more you fight it and try to get your legs to move, the less likely they are to move. So stop your motion. The second is stand tall, because more often than not, you're leaning forward, and therefore you're giving gravity the advantage. So get your weight over your feet. Eliminate how much force gravity has on you. Then shift your weight side to side. You have done something that brought your weight either forward or back. So to shift weight side to side helps break it. And then finally, take a big step. And that oftentimes helps. For his dizziness, for out of bed, we broke down how to get out of bed. Because he was a fellow that would scoop himself up, use his abs, and all of a sudden, he's up in no time. Well, number one, that made him really tight as he scooped himself right out of bed. But number two, it got him very dizzy because he did it fast. So breaking it down to bending your knees, roll onto your side, press up into sitting. This is a common technique used for all people after back surgery. It's a very healthy back um, technique. However, I know this isn't going to happen in the middle of the night when you're hurrying up to get out of bed because you have to use the bathroom real quick and it's urgent. So for those matters, he keeps a urinal bedside because he does get dizzy when he first sits up and we don't want him to fall because he has fallen going to the bathroom. So there's a compensation. But when getting into bed in the middle or as he's going to bed, he does this. And when getting out of the bed first thing in the morning and he doesn't have to rush, he does it and it has helped. Also a bed wedge. If he's laying flat in bed, think of that arc of motion to come to sitting. It's a bigger arc than if he has a wedge under him. Okay, so now he doesn't have to travel quite as far. So that has been helpful as well. And then I told him the 10 second rule. The 10 second rule for feeling dizzy. Whenever you change position, wait 10 seconds. I tell him, you're not working now, there's no rush, stop. You know, you have some extra time, you can wait 10 seconds. And he does, he counts it. All right, and I'm sorry I'm rushing. We just have a lot of tips to go through so we can get to those questions and answers. So here is my person with CBD, and her name is M. And she was diagnosed three years following an initial diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And then what happened was we started to see a lot of tightness and rigidity on her one arm. It was progressing much faster than what is seen with normal idiopathic Parkinson's disease, and she was also reporting a lot of pain in that arm. She did have a shuffling gait, and then also a lot of slurring in her speech. Also important to know that she's bilingual. English is her second language and Greek is her first. And I say that only because her current level of function, she has progressed so much that she now no longer speaks English. And she's reverted to only speaking Greek, which is very interesting to the physicians. And we're still looking more at that. She has constant supervision, an amazing family, actually. Her daughters are incredibly supportive. She requires assistance for everything. She cannot get up out of a chair by herself, nor can she get out of any other surface. So a lot of hands-on assist of at least moderate assist, which we call 50% of the work. So she's doing about 25 to 50% effort. Um, she does get Botox in her hand and elbow and towards the shoulder to help her manage with the pain. And she has been seeing occupational therapy to get some resting splints to assist in prevention of contracture, which a contracture is if somebody comes in and they have a stiff hand, but I'm able to move that hand back into neutral, if you will, then it's not a fixed stiffness. I can attain that. If their hand is tight and I physically can no longer get the joint to move or because the tissue has become so taut that it's not releasing, then we start to consider that a contracture and label it as such and we want to avoid that. Because as soon as contracture set in, that's going to directly affect your ability to use that limb and that joint. 
So, previously talking about when I first met her and before, exercise is important. So we did a lot with, we took elements of the LSVT big program, which is a program used often in Parkinson's disease. We took elements of that because she loved dance. And given I have a, a background in that, we just moved a lot with that. It was fun for her. She enjoyed it very much. We could use aspects of music that really helped her mood and lighten things up and also helped a lot with her compliance. And we did that, however, knowing progression of this illness, we also instituted a now heavily focus on passive range of motion. And that means that I, in both sitting and laying down, somebody else is moving the joint. It's always important to consider what you do to one joint directly affects the joint above it and below it. So it does require, it's not just somebody taking your hand and moving your arm up and down. It's about learning how to support all the joints of the limb and move, using your body to move with them in a very rhythmical way because we know the changes in the brain have caused this asymmetry and has, have caused the body to basically lose its rhythm. So you're trying through your body to convey that rhythm back to the, the person. Techniques to prevent posture. I always show this because when, I, oh, some people sat up straighter, I love it. Posture, sit up, squeeze your shoulder blades, right? Stop rolling back, fix your pelvis. Um, is very important. Some sneaky tricks that we've done with M is putting, when she's sitting down, she tends to slump to one side. Rather than keeping the controls, the phone, her book on that side, it goes on the other side. So she's got to go there. When friends and family are sitting down and talking with her, they sit on the side, away from the side, she slumps. It causes her to go that way, which is important. But also propping. Okay, don't let the person slump and don't just keep pushing them the other way because guess what? They're going to fall back. So it's more about propping, using gravity to your advantage and helping the person lift up a little bit more. Using different sensory tricks, which actually I've been talking to the lovely therapist at UF about and, and I'm already getting some ideas about taping, et cetera, which is great. But therapists have great cues for that. And change of position is also good, too. Our bodies are not meant to be still. All right, It's important for us to move. And even though it may be difficult to move, it's organizing the day. You do that with a therapist. Organizing the day so that it's planned out. We all have good intentions, but to put them in action and organize them makes us all more compliant with them. She's also been seeing the, ther the occupational therapist for more splinting, using different wraps to keep her fingers apart, different things for comfort, so that when she is resting, that that hand is in a better position. But nothing is ever prefabbed, so it's got to be particular to the person, and it's got to be able to change with the person, so it's very specific to her. And finally, guarding technique. I'm going, Michelle. Guarding technique is um, <laughs> important. Because a lot of times people, for example, want to help somebody by pulling them up from a chair. It's more about being beside the person, guiding their motion, being close to the person, using your body to shift their weight side to side. If you stay close and if you know they can't lift a leg, help them lean over to one side to get that leg to lift. She did start with using a rollator, but remember, it was that arm that was really stiff. You need two arms to work with the rollator. So that soon fell out of the picture. So now it truly is a handheld assist in shifting weight side to side. Likewise, a transport wheelchair, which is the lighter wheelchair without the big wheels in the back, the small wheels, and using her legs to push herself and get herself around. She also does that. Giving targets to help with posture. Keep your eyes on that clock. Keep your eyes on the refrigerator. That's where we're heading. X marks the spot, giving that destination. And then finally, a gait belt, which you see more of these these days rather than the traditional one that you actually physically put on like a belt. But this one, you can adjust to the size. It's a gait belt with handles, and you can move your hand to different positions and give support different ways from directly behind to the side, and that's very useful as well. All right, and you know I had to put in a Rocky reference, right? So here it is. A tip for everyone, okay, be it PSP, MSA, CBD. Your care partner who is with you is not there to nag. Consider them to be your coach. They are your corner man. They are your Mickey. So join together as a team 
work with your therapist, develop a good support system, organize your day. By doing that, it'll give you a sense of control and also productivity that you are doing something, you feel good about it. And also remember, don't forget, it's easy to have good intentions. Use those markers, put up those post-its, those reminder signs, use music. It's so, so very beneficial. And how to find a therapist close to you. And you know, I'm spoiled being in Philadelphia. I, I just had this conversation with somebody. We are in a Parkinson saturated area. I have support groups and conferences out the wazooey. And I talk to people down here and you guys are traveling from all over the place coming here. Do some legwork. Get a home therapist into the house, but call that company. Has anybody had exposure? Are they on this list of, do they have LSVT big certification? Although this is not for atypical Parkinson's, at least they understand Parkinson's disease. Likewise, Parkinson's wellness and recovery is a certification for PTs and OTs. And again, it's a little bit of exposure if they're not necessarily in a specialized center. And that's my pup. He says, thank you. Look at that stretch, right? Very good. I will be leaving my cards at the front table where you registered. Although I am many miles away from you, please do realize that I am just an email or phone call away and can absolutely send information. Work with a therapist who is closer to you. We do it all the time, send information to therapists, and I would be very, very happy to do so. Thank you all so very much.